Welcome to the Chaos and Light podcast. I am your host, Angela Levesque. I have a great guest for you today, Nick Jorowski, and we talk all about shame. We look at shame, how, sh- how shame is utilized in different cultures, if there's ever a way where it can be productive, or is it always harmful? Um, is shame really about power? And we look at the difference between shame that somebody feels because they live out of congruence with their own values, and shame is a verb, uh, which is used as a way to control or modify somebody else's behavior. So that will be coming up in just a couple of minutes. Um, Of course, my listeners know that the Chaos and Light podcast is actually part of the Chaos and Light community, which you can find at chaosandlight.com where it's a group of spiritual seekers coming together to, you know, hold space for one another, to support each other, give resources. It's just a supposed to be a frequent touch point for uh, your own spiritual journey. So if you haven't checked that out, please do. We also have some really exciting events coming up. Um, as usual, we have the Living Light Meditation Gallery that gathering, which is free to members and non-members alike. So we still have two more coming up in February on the 21st and the 28th. Uh, No need to be a member, but you do need to register and the link will be sent to you in the email. We also have another event called Releasing Stuck Energy with Lisa Martin-Namey. She is the co-founder of the Chaos and Light community and that is free for community members and available for non-members for $29. So if you want to find more about that, go to chaosandlight.com forward slash event. Well, um, after this short break, we will be back with, with Nick Jarowski. Do you need more spiritual sustenance in your daily life? Check out chaosandlight.com, where new articles, blogs, meditations are added weekly. chaosandlight.com a playground for mind, mystery, and human potential. Well, I'm here today with Nick Jarowski. I might have pronounced that incorrectly, but I'll get him to correct us in a moment. He's a digital audio producer, podcast host, and founder of Podcast Monster, a digital audio production company. Over the past six years, Nick has been producing and editing podcasts with the New York Times bestselling authors, thought leaders, Silicon Valley tech companies, and other entrepreneurs. Currently, Nick is passionate about his new show, Shame Rules, which explores the hidden ways that shame appears or shapes our world. Each episode explores the way that shame has helped determine the outcome of so many stories. Nick, welcome to the Chaos and Light podcast. I'm so happy to be here, Angela. Uh, I thank you for being up so early and functioning where you are. <laughs> um, that's a real, you should, you should get a medal for that. So well, good job. Thank you. Well, I want to say, um, I want to start and give you an opportunity just to share a little bit about what Shame Rules is and tell us where, you know, the original idea, like what got you excited about talking about this topic? Well, you know, I'm as a podcast producer, I've edited so many episodes. I, I, I cringe a little bit when I go, don't be that guest who talks eight minutes about a thing that can take 40 seconds to actually say. So I'll say this, uh, you know, I, I I don't think you start any project without some relationship to what it is. So obviously for me, shame is a real underlying uh, motivator, really the avoidance of shame. That's a lot of us, although we don't always really call it out the way it is. And, but the idea for this show specifically, I have another show called Where There's Smoke, which explores self-development through the lens of current events, pop culture and experience and make that with a, another person. And I had pitched this idea for shame like five years ago. And I was like, well, great. Those are usually like 30 minute episodes. And I was like, great, it could be this. And, you know, usually Brett and I split it. So I'm like looking at 15 minutes or so. And I kept going, well, it could be this thing or it could be this thing. And then I realized, oh no, there's no way to really pin down shame. We talk about shame as if it's kind of one thing a lot. It's that feeling, right? We can talk about that in a second. Um, But then as I kept going, I was like, no, shame as like a as like a weapon shame is a force shame uh does stuff right to us and around us and as i started doing that i this like structural element of shame really came came out and so i had a little bit extra time and i said let's just make a show about shame and and hopefully the goal for any listeners is that it's a it's an approachable show our goal is not to feel 
bad about shame all the time because then we don't want to talk about it so uh, uh that's sort of where it comes from and uh you know we try to grapple with with shame's role in education shame's role in sort of um you know I, my more most recent episodes about the role of shame and in, in, in parades and the, the various forms in which parades take um which is interesting right you know this so we can talk about that but so that that's sort of the idea we want to step one step out of the internalized uh, sort of feeling of shame and go, well, what is the work of shame? So uh, I think in the email I sent you, the difference between shame being uh, a verb, like I'm shaming you, um, or I felt shame. So <laughs> uh, I, I think that what you said about um, shame being a motivator or trying to avoid shame is a motivator, I think there are two different ways to look at it. The idea of um, personal shame. Like I know, uh, for example, I've done some things, especially in my twenties when I drank too much and, you know, you do some stupid shit and, and, and that shame actually can be a motivator, right? That you, you wake up and you're like, okay. So for me in that instance, I would say shame is um, when we are knowingly living outside of our own values. So we do things that are contrary or incongruent to, to who we really want to be. And then I think that there's shame um, when that is more of imposition, where somebody or an authority outside of us is shaming us in a, in a way to change um, our behavior in some way. Um, yeah. And your, does your show mostly deal with the latter? Well, it's hard to tease them apart. You know, you that point you made about, you know, I don't drink, but my 20s were full of shame. <laughs> I think it's probably a shame time for a lot of people. But it's interesting. I think your point about the feeling of shame is what you feel when you step outside of your own values is true. But there is an element of sometimes it's not about your own. You can feel shame about values you don't hold, but you think you should. And you can feel shame about the fact that you don't have those values. So it's like, there's a whole trap. But so the shame as a mechanism is about sort of belonging to whatever this group is. You know, the sh they call shame a, a self-conscious emotion, right? You have to imagine the self and you have to imagine the relationship to the other and the what the other thinks about you based on your actions. And so let's say you do something and maybe you think it's fine. And then it's brought to your attention that the people that you need or feel like you need to view you positively do not feel that positively. You'll feel shame about the fact that you didn't feel shame. So it's really, <laughs> it's really kind of a trap because there is some, I know, and I'm not an expert in this, right? I just like a, I'm a former reformed academic who considers himself a journalist who's just done it. I can show you my book of shame things and all the interviews I've done. So this is not something that I'm with put on you know etch in stone but there's a debate over whether or not shame is evolutionary right you know it is a very very early emotion that you, you have to start asking well why why do we develop it it's natural we all experience it and it does seem to suggest that there is some value to it right we feel tremendous shame when it comes to how our parents view us and if you think about that there is some logic to that because we need them <laughs> right and shame in terms of what our community is and i know we're going to talk about it later but there is a little bit of a breakdown as to the role of in how I feel shame and also how I am shamed in sort of our digital culture. So it's all a mess. It is all a mess. <laughs> yes, I do. That's interesting about it being seeming to, to be sort of a, an evolutionary um, aspect that that's been there. And, and I've actually, I can't remember his name escapes me now, but he was, um, there was this author and he was talking about, uh, egalitarian societies and that shame was actually used in societies early where everybody was seen as equal. So for example, when they, in hunter gatherer societies, when they had to share, um, you know, the kill. And so you would have these really big brawn, like top of their game men who would go out and they would, they would consistently bring in the most food and all of that. And sometimes they were getting too big for their britches. So the elders in the community would then use um, shame in a way, whether they were kind of like sliding them, joking, cutting them down or holding them up as a kind of as a, 
I don't know, it's a symbol to say this isn't how we act in this in this regard where we're all supposed to seen as equal. So in that regard, shame was a sort of a powerful tool for um, keeping keeping peace in the in the society. And I thought that that was kind of an interesting thing, because usually you always think of shame as negative, but perhaps that's a piece of um, its kind of evolutionary trajectory. Yeah, there's a, I did an interview with a man named Colin Leach, I believe is his name. He's, an, he's a academic uh, professor, maybe at Columbia, maybe at NYU. I'm so sorry, Dr. Leach. But he actually is, is one of the people who, you know, the general feeling is that shame is um, a bad negative feeling and that generally in modern times, it is bad to feel negative things. And it is what they call, you know, anti-social or at least not pro-social in that way, because shame asks us to, you know, if you feel shame, you, I mean, that's one of the things, right? How do you recognize if someone else feels shame, you know, their face might get flushed, they might avert their eyes, they might um, struggle to talk, they, you know, kids will literally cower in the corner. Um, but he argues that there is something about if you if you buy into the feeling of shame, it's not necessarily antisocial, and that it can be pro-social because it's telling yourself, "I am transgressing something." It's it's like a it's a check on yourself to go, something's wrong. I like these people, or I need these people, or or whatever. So the the verdict to me, just being a guy who read a bunch of stuff and talked to a lot of people, is that it is way more complicated, and that in some ways, shame, unless make sure we're clear about this. It's not like, you know, if you were not so much about shame is wrapped up in power. So I don't want to look at a, a smaller communities previous to the criminal justice system, or, you know, it's not like we haven't had, um, you know, the patriarchy for thousands of years or whatever. I mean, shame, it's all a problem. So I'm not suggesting like, Oh, in the good old days, <laughs> but <laughs> back when shame was good for us. <laughs> right. So I don't want to suggest that, but I, I will say that at least had it, there was probably more rope in its utility um, earlier, like when communities were smaller and your reliance on each other was clearer and it was real. Um, now where our bonds have broken down related to like what our needs are. I don't need you to go hunt the thing. You don't need me, like whatever. It's all, it does feel a little bit different and a little bit more weaponized, but it's like really fascinating to think of. And I would, I think it's pre- entirely uninteresting to suggest any viewpoint that's like shame is just bad like i don't that that is sort of a a non-starter conversation for me a because it's boring b because it's something we have and if we just sort of say it's bad i shouldn't feel it you're gonna spend a lot of time failing at that endeavor endeavor Well, to give a more modern day example, so you know that I live in Japan, and they have what they what some people call the shame honor culture. Yes. And so again, not that Japan's completely egalitarian or anything, but they certainly uh, value social harmony and group consensus. And it's a much more uh, collectivist society than in the US. And so certainly, shame is an important part here. But again, it is sort of shame from the outside, but a lot of that, that whole shame honor thing is that to live outside of your values or to live outside that's contrary to the group is incredibly dishonorable. Mm. And so there is certainly, I mean, there's very high suicide rates here. And, uh, you know, you, I've heard stories of people who, um, did something bad at their job and then ended up committing suicide in their office, things like that. So it's not, again, it's a very complex and nuanced conversation, but on the flip side, you know, those stories that you hear about if you leave your wallet on the train or that it will be returned to you, or, you know, I go for walks all over, you know, Japan in the nighttime and I'm never concerned about my safety. So there is, it's an incredibly safe culture because there is sort of that piece of collective social pressure to to be and live in integrity. And certainly their value systems, uh, their values are are aligned with 
um, you know, seeing each other as, as a group and, you know, valuing that social harmony. So it's kind of an interesting thing. It's, there's certainly things that are negative about it, but then there's also some things that I think kind of work because of that value of the group. Well, you know, everything's nuanced. I, I'm interested early on in my, uh, I, I pulled out, a, I just happened to have this with me, this lovely book called Shame, A Brief History, which is a fascinating read. But uh, early on, this concept of like honor code, like samurai, um, and comes up, and it really does start to feel like a little bit of a mixed bag. It has the good, it has its bad. But are you familiar with this concept of the hikikomori? Mm-mm. So when I first started Shame Rules, somebody brought this up. I don't think it's going to make an episode in the next run, but <clears throat> I thought about it a lot. Basically, it's these people i want to say it was mostly men but i could be wrong about that who um struggled with at school or at a job this is in japan obviously although there's other versions of it around the world and because from my understanding of the way that you're slotted into kind of your schooling and career that they kind of perhaps felt like they missed their on-ramp and because of that they just totally withdraw from society where they basically like live with their parents and they don't go outside unless it's like at night because they don't want to be seen. And it's sort of a whole, it's a problem. I mean, if in another time, I might call it like a social pandemic. Obviously, I would not say that now, but that it, it is a recognized issue. If you look up Hikikomori on Google, you'll see a bunch of stuff on it. But it is interesting. It is something that we see in the United States, but it does feel to be um, because of the sense of my responsibility is to do my part any any even an accidental stepping outside of that can cause like great emotional distress and probably feels very unsafe you probably feel like a real failure i mean everyone else is doing. I mean, you can just see how like the shame at least in america you know with all of its things there is a breakdown i think a little bit of shame connected to individualism which is great if you're in need of that space to be an individual right especially again i mean i want to connect this to power and to other stuff especially if you were not uh affluent educated white dude you know or especially if you're trans or if you're part of the i mean all these places where you go if we're in a shame society where i need this to kind of be one thing because we're all doing it together it doesn't provide you any air to, to be anything else and so there's a lot of freedom with the lessening of it and so that's again why it's all kind of a mixed bag i I mean i've spent two years on this and i kind of go shame is shame (laughs) like (laughs) it's like i can't there's not really an answer other than it's a real thing and um sometimes i wish that you know we could feel more shame but i will say that uh, our current situation in america specifically is beginning of february in 2021 is not from a lack of shame So I I do want to suggest, I I think people think that we are shameless now, but I actually don't think that's the case. No, let's move on to, to, you know, taking this conversation more to the way that shame is um, just interacting with our society right now. And you see it in so many different ways. And uh, like, if we talk about, let's talk about the Bill Maher segment. I don't know. Did you get a chance to watch it? Um, Yes. (laughs) He, uh, so this is a segment you can find on YouTube. He did, um, I don't know, a while ago, he still had an audience. So it was prior to shutdown. And he talks about that we need to bring shaming back that people in order need to lose weight, they need to think more about their health. And shame is the first step to reform in his mind. And that, um, yeah, that that's where we should start, that we don't, we don't accept uh, smokers, we sort of shamed them out of their habit. Uh, he used another example, I can't recall, but um, that we need to start doing that, this whole body positivity movement is actually more harmful than helpful. And we need to start, you know, not accepting this level of, of um, obesity, and for example, so what were your initial thoughts on that? It was well, pretty harsh. This, well, it's I forgot. It's been such a long time since I've watched Bill Maher, and it was like traveling back to 2007. <laughs> I can't say that I enjoyed it <laughs> very much, but um, you know, at that point about smoking and and the data kind of escapes me right now. But I do think 
that is a very good example that it does appear somebody will correct me if i'm wrong that shame and shaming of smokers actually was effective in that way but the research also suggests that shaming people related to their health is not particularly effective and so you do have to get to this question of do you want to get what you want or do you want to be right right which is always the kind of a thing that we need to deal with in any relationships with anyone on the planet and i just don't think that shame is particularly useful if you're trying to change someone's heart and so particularly at a time when they don't need you right you're gonna what you're gonna shame this this man living in in i live in missouri lives in they live in missouri because they are overweight and then what they don't know you that like i just I, I don't i don't fully know what that is i don't fully know what that mechanism is obviously obesity is an issue it is not good for your health um but it doesn't seem i just like struggle to be like well I don't even want to be that person either. Like, so I want to like recognize the, the role of shame in our lives and in the world sort of as an unavoidable thing like air or gravity. But I also don't want to be the person who is like in the practice of shaming, <laughs> like <laughs> in, in both of those ways. So uh, even, and, and I guess if you were to say, but it's good for you. And we talk about that in the second episode of Shame Rules related to purity. We're going to shame all these children into not having sex because it's more important that they don't have sex than it is for them to not feel shame. The problem is, is that there is no evidence that that works. So now all you've done is just made people feel awful and given them less information for how to protect themselves from unwanted pregnancies or STIs. And so you, you go, well, what, what's it for? So I'd have to see evidence that it would work. And then I'd still have to go, I don't know, is that how I want to live my life? I guess if I really think it's more important for people to be alive and healthy, then yeah, I guess maybe so. I don't know if that made any sense. I don't know where you stand <laughs> on it. Uh, well, yeah. I agree with you. The idea, you know, my background is actually exercise physiology and helping people to shift their, um, the way that they eat and the way that they move their body is difficult because it's connected to everything else. It's connected to culture. It's, you know, there's, there's so many other things that feed into that. So to just go and, and it seems too simplistic to just say, let's just shame these people into eating better and get, you, that doesn't work because there's so there's too many other things. And ultimately, like you said, when you start to make people feel bad about themselves, they often are using food and other, you know, things like that in order to deal with those emotions. So I, I think that that is an entirely unproductive approach to, to this idea. <laughs> well, and I guess the question would be, would Bill Maher in that context say that we should shame like addicts of other substances and chemicals? Would you go, we should shame the meth addicts? And I, I don't think the answer is yes. I mean, in fact, I would argue that that's probably the problem. Right. So it, there's, it just like doesn't hold up for me. Like, and, and I, I really was struck because I hadn't really encountered something like that, like a t for such a long time in this whole process. And I really was like, Oh, I like, don't like, this. like, I like you're very physically was like this. Don't, don't sully shame in this way. <laughs> like, which is really messed up considering how destructive it can be. But it's like, you know, if you're, have the time and the ability to think critically. I just don't see how you get to that point and can be taken particularly seriously. I mean, that come at me, Bill Maher people, but I, I, I just, I don't, it might make you feel really good to go. I'm not that person, which is really a key component of shame. It's so much about the shamer more so than the shamed. Uh, but I, I it just, it sounds like a terrible way to live your life. Yes. And he was actually, um, many people spoke out about that segment it was it caused a, a really big <laughs> thing on on twitter and you know, yeah it was I, I i hope that he kind of stepped back a bit and thought about it because his delivery was very harsh and judgmental and i i just like i said i don't think that's productive so you do see though a lot of people um, and even actually in the response to that segment, in a way, we're sort of shaming him. So this tends to be a thing that you see on social media that uh, we have people saying, you know, shaming other people for shaming other people, which yeah. is is kind of strange. Yeah, shame on you. Uh, 
but th- okay so now we get to talk about a thing that i do not have concrete isn't it great you have me as a guest and i'm like i don't know i don't know anything. <laughs> but uh <laughs> but we we enter into this space which is like what does shame look like in modern times and if shame at one point had so okay so communities have changed over thousands of years right it used to be that the only community that you ever had was the community of the people who were near you physically and that would be it for the rest of your life that was it and so at that point you do definitely need those people we're a social uh uh, species we need each other to survive that's how we got where we are you know um so shame back then you can you can sort of see how it could work its utility for from like a species level right it may feel bad for you but if the goal of a species is to keep surviving it's like hey you human you got to get your stuff together because we have to do a thing the problem is is that so they call it you know that would be like community of place and now over time it started with um like letters and it started with um you know air travel and then phone calls and i mean this is not a chronological list but you can see over time the breakdown of what it means to your community can then ex- expand outside of its physical location and expand into these communities of interest and so it used to be you could drive to a conference and talk to other real estate agents or whatever that was a huge deal now it's that i can go online and live almost my entire entire life um bound by a community of interest and if i were to get kicked out of that community i can just go to another one i can find an endless supply of them and at that point you start to go well shame doesn't have any other value as much value because it doesn't cost me anything to be shame. You know, I, I know we talk about cancel culture and stuff. I just like, isn't it kind of good that we can hold powerful people to account for once? I'm really disinterested in a discussion over like cancel culture for those who have voice. Um, yeah, if you cancel your neighbor, who's just a person, that's bad. <laughs> but, you know, politicians, my own Senator Josh Hawley, talking about oh. how, how he's it's like you're in the wall street journal or you're on te- you're on television 10 times a day you need to get a grip and like i don't even think he's being sincere about it himself but that's another whole thing uh so there is something though about the cycle of shame which only functions as like a vehicle for anger and for value uh um i'm forgetting the word right now for, just for displaying my own values rather than for accomplishing anything virtue signaling that's what i'm looking for right um and you're never gonna shame somebody who you don't know right (laughs) like hey bill maher i'm type 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 twitter and he goes oh i read this tweet from nick and now i feel so much shame that i feel differently i'm going to behave differently like there's no real mechanism it doesn't like what like like what's the i don't i don't understand what everyone's doing truly and we see that now i you know i do not feel like this is political but you've got people who subscribe to like insane QAnon theories or to you know a a fake presidential election whatever and yeah it would feel really great to go you're an idiot (laughs) stop it i get that i understand the impulse but you're not going to accomplish anything other than feel really good about yourself which you shouldn't because you're being a jerk but that's The cycle really seems to be broken, and I know I'm rambling a lot, but the other last step to this would be, if that's how everything plays out, and we don't allow people grace to change ideas or change their minds, right, everything is, you know, an opinion I had 10 years ago still exists in some corner of the internet somewhere, why would I ever change my mind anyway? No one's going to give me any grace to change it, they're going to say you should have known better the first time, you know, we don't hold opinions in the same way that we used to because everything exists forever and everybody has access to it. Whereas before, maybe my neighbor voted for Donald Trump this time and I was so mad about it and, or, you know, a hundred years ago, whatever. And he eventually kind of slowly changes his mind and we never talk about it. We don't have to, and he's allowed to do that. You know, like there's so much space back then and, and we've lost it. And so the, the shame, this is to come all the way back. Here we go, come back around the station. <laughs> This is all to say that it does feel broken in those spaces. We still have interpersonal shame. We still do things that we feel shame for. But there's something that as like a, as a tool online that I just go like, I don't know, this feels really messed up. Is that, does any of that track? <laughs> going, it does. Yeah, I've talked for like eight hours. I don't know if it made any sense, but yeah. <laughs> 
No, it really does track. Um, you made a, you brought up a couple of points. I do want to talk about power. Uh, but this yep. idea, you said that this, when we're talking about shame, it has more to do with the shamer than the person being shamed. And I think that that is when you're speaking about everything that you were talking about. Um, I think that's it is that we need to have a little bit more introspection in that regard to, to understand, is this my shit that I'm actually looking at? What am I getting? Yeah. What is it? Because how often, and you touched on this a little bit in your very first episode, how often is the shamer really struggling with those exact things like that, that they're shaming somebody else for? Very, very often, right? The person. The yeah, pers- you you can only recognize it in someone else if you, if you somehow know it in yourself. And, and I really like, this is like a little tangential, but I, I really truly believe that any person on this planet is like one or two bad decisions away from doing truly shameful things. Um, I don't even think it's that, like, I don't even think it requires that much to go wrong. And so because of that, I'm not saying that I am some like saint or whatever, but I do feel like I have a lot, I give people a lot of leeway to go like, man, I don't know, that sounds like a crazy trip to this point for you. Um, You know, and so that doesn't help them at all, but at least I spend, I don't spend really any time online. Oh God, people are going to dig up tweets now, but I, I, at least I haven't in the last five or six years spent any time online, like fighting my battles on someone's timeline. I will message people direct messages and I'll go, Hey, this is interesting, whatever. But I like the, the public nature of it provides no actual space for change. What? I mean, I, I, I the more I say it all out, I go, we're really messing this up. <laughs> So what in your mind, then, if you see um, somebody doing something that you think is wrong, or yeah, inappropriate, how would you suggest if not to shame them publicly? How would you suggest that we deal with it as a culture? Well, I think it's tough. I, I just think that there's like, I think that people who invite themselves into our lives, <clears throat> whether it be elected office or uh, CEO or whatever. I think that the rules are different for them. And I know that we think they're not because my neighbor, I keep, my neighbor's a lovely person. I keep referencing this imaginary neighbor. They're <laughs> perfectly nice. But my neighbor feels like they're just, they're like just as online as Bill Gates is, right? They're both online. They're, I can go look at their Twitter. I can go whatever. It's the, So it feels like they're the same, but they're like fundamentally not. And so I do think, again, I want to go, if you're a yeah, if you're a politician, if you're an, even an athlete or a musician, which is my background, you know, there is, you're in the, if you've asked for people to give you money <laughs> and attention and fame and respect, then I do think that the, the, the rules of engagement are different. And I might write an article. I might do a thing. I once on Where There's Smoke got really mad at Taylor Swift because I was like, <clears throat> how hard is it to say, don't call me an Aryan princess? Like, it's not that hard, right? So, but that's different than my neighbor who I should go talk to in person. And those like personal engagements where it's like, I care enough about you to put myself in front of you is I think we forget that that's a vulnerable place because we're just so used to just like lobbing all of this stuff from these, you know, I once heard a back in like 2008 or something, I heard an NPR episode about warfare and they were talking about how you know, basically we're entering into a place where warfare isn't really about how many people you're willing to lose. It becomes who has the best robots and who can fight the best from a distance and who can keep supplying all those things. And there's something about that with social media as well, where it's like, how much damage can I try to attempt with really no stakes in it at all? So, and having said that, all kinds of good things happen online. So it's always the next bag. I mean, just this morning, there were people you know, sort of we're accusing Marilyn Manson of, mm-hmm. of sexual assault and other stuff. And it's, that's, a, and it, to me, that's an example of somebody who is powerful of being held to account. I would take that as a positive. Some people call that cancel culture. And I go, I don't, wh- whose battle are you fighting, man? Like, <laughs> so, yeah. <clears throat> so in what you're saying though, going back to that idea of power dynamics and traditionally, uh, and you give lots of examples in your podcast through really 
Um, it's actually a really master class. The production value of your podcast, I need to say, is just fantastic. I just oh, so I enjoyed just, it. I was just actually about to tell. I, we didn't say it. It's a narrative show. Yeah. So all this rambling I'm doing, I've edited out and I've scripted. <laughs> And there's other people on the show. There's music. It's like, it's attempting to, I grew up on, I, my claim to fame is I grew up listening to uh, This American Life before it was a podcast. I used to sit down at six o'clock and listen to it on my bed. And so uh, it's, that's what I, that's my favorite thing to do. So it is, it's very pointed. It's very story-based. Sorry. Yes. And it beautifully produced. I really enjoyed Thanks. it from that, from that perspective as well. So, but going back to the the power dynamic, what I'm hearing you so traditionally, those in power have used shame as a way to um, either de- as a deterrent, as a way to um, create be- behavior modification. And you're saying that you feel it's okay that for people who traditionally don't have power can then use shame as a way to shift the behavior of those who traditionally have held it. Well, I mean, what else can you do? You know, I mean, I, I, I mean, how many weapons, I use weapons, you know, maybe tools is a better word, right? How many tools do the less powerful have to hold the powerful to account? And like, there's a whole, like, sort of, I keep using war analogies, and I really wish I weren't, but there's a whole, like, battle over the idea of, like, well, who's allowed to shame and who's whatever. And as always, there's only certain people who benefit from the discussion about it at all. You know, the idea of cancel culture benefits, um, you know, the people who are so mad about cancel culture are not me and you. <laughs> Maybe you are, but it's not, you know, my, the, I used to be a teacher. It's not my fellow teachers. It's not, you know, it's only people who are being canceled who are mad about it. And you go, well, yeah, because <laughs> that's all we have. We don't have any other mechanism to hold people to account. We're not going to put you in the stocks. We're not going to hang you. We're not going to all these other things. So what we're saying is, is we don't like this. Now you can be, I think what people confuse is they go, well, I'm being canceled. And I think that what they're actually doing is that they're, they're not recognizing that they are actually feeling shame, right? The anger from it, like, this is ridiculous. How could you go? Yeah, that feeling, you need to explore that feeling. If it didn't actually mean anything to you, I don't know. I mean, you know, and again, in the exceptions of people who are like normal people who find themselves, there are all kinds of famous stories of that about people who write what's her face, who posted a bad joke on a plane and goes to Africa mm-hmm. and the whole internet, you know, uh, Justine Sacco, I think is her name. Um, but other than that, you go, well, this is all we've got. And I am, it's not something that I do, but I also do need to recognize that it's a thing that people have done forever. So... <laughs> we could try a whole re-education thing but at this point based on who is most upset about quote-unquote cancel culture i think if we just take like two seconds two seconds we go oh yeah they're scared that's why that's why this is so terrifying is that they're afraid that they might actually be held to account for something so i'm not i'm not pro cancel culture. i want to be clear i don't not it's not my interest in to shame people but i find it very rich I just find it really funny to, to be to people be so up in arms in it about it. Well, I think I probably slightly disagree with you on some of those things, but I let me hear it. <laughs> <laughs> I want all of it. Well, I can be totally wrong. I I fundamentally have a problem with if we want to make some changes in society. I don't find that using the same actions against somebody as they used on you as an as a good way to get us out of it like no, so I, for <clears throat> oh no i would totally agree with that and i that's probably a good clarification my point is really about it's not something that i would do it's not something i would teach my children to do it's not something that i think we necessarily should do i'm more interested in the reaction to it because it is also natural and no one who gets canceled like like uh, you think about like Ben Shapiro or all these like right wing whatever, and you go, are you think about how much shame they put out into the world <laughs> every day, and for like four hours they have to deal with it, and they can't, and that that is sort of my point is I go like let's just note the hypocrisy, <laughs> yes. um, but I also do want to highlight that there are limited tools, 
if yes. you're if you're not the powerful then you do have to we should make a list of what can we actually do um other than hold people and you know i was just listening to this thing the other day about like the the stories around um you know about like stories of like kings and the bodily functions of kings and queens or whatever were actual real stories of fodder because it it was shameful to think that maybe they had these you know they would fart or they would whatever <laughs> and those have power there's nothing inherently shameful about anything really you know something's shameful about being overweight unless we've ascribed to it nothing shameful about being trans unless we ascribe those things so there's it's also a moving target in and of itself around the idea of we have to buy into the idea that anything is shameful to start with. And then I do your, I'm totally cut you off, but I wanted, I think your point is correct. If I need to investigate why I wouldn't do it and why I'm saying it's cool. I'm not saying it's cool, but I just think it's rich. <laughs> the reaction well, I found to your Like for using your example of Ben Shapiro, like he asked for it and in some ways he, he is kind of like, bring it on. So yeah. Ben Shapiro, but to, speak about what you were saying before about how there's less and less space and how we've moved into a place of, of not be, there's no, there's no space for redemption or forgiveness. And that's, I think my biggest issue is that yes, we can call people out, but there's no path for them to, to move back into good graces. And I think that's a really, really destructive force in our society because we all fuck up like there's just no we all have our shit we all you know there's just no and it's one thing to call people out um but it's a whole entire thing to not accept people's like somebody will come out with an apology and oh that wasn't stated right or you know he doesn't deserve to have a livelihood anymore and I think that that is really poisonous well, I think that's true. It's complicated in that, at least here in America, right? We we want to have sort of like let the market decide things and then people get mad when the market decides things. Um, and it's not like, and so for example, we talk about people like, well, I can't make a living anymore. And you go, first of all, um, you can. Plenty of people get to do other jobs. <laughs> like, so I, 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 it's not my mode of operation but you ever watch the simpsons yes so what i think i'm sure there's papers written about it because i'm sure there's college classes about it but for me the most interesting thing about the simpsons as like a thing to study and i have not done this is their real focus on crowds like crowds in the simpsons always act in these very like monolithic insane ways and we're we're you know we we kind of watch it and goes and that whatever i i think it's like I, I I think it's worth noting that we need to do better, but we also can't pretend that people are going to people. And I will say that the idea for space is key. And I, we were watch, we watched a documentary about, you know, uh, John Lewis, like maybe a week or two ago. And he, you know, famously forgave the man who opened his head open when he was, you know, peacefully marching. And we're watching all this footage of, of what it meant to be, um, you know, to, to do good trouble right to get into good trouble and i saw that and i went well you know if he can do that that's a thing that actually happened to him and he was clearly right right like he has every he's got everything in his corner he, he was right <laughs> he got hurt by another person who was clearly wrong uh sent to the hospital all this other stuff and he's able to give space for that i go well we have no excuse so i'm not excusing the individual um and we definitely do need to say we need to figure out a way to live online where the permanent text does not become attached to the person permanently. Yeah. Cause these are like fleeting thoughts. Most people are just firing stuff out. And can you imagine if when you're, you know, shooting the shit with your friend and somebody was taking a recording of that and well, Nick back on February 2nd at 8 49 PM, you said this, like it, we're not designed to be held to account in that regard. Like there needs to be room for, because the, the, uh, the tools themselves are blunt tools. Like when you have to convey a, a conversation in 280 characters or like a, a point in 280 characters, that really limits, there is an opportunity for complexity. And 
so there's just so many kind of pieces that fall together here that that prevents us from really having those conversations that might be the antidote to, to using shame or you know some quick quip against somebody. Well, that's really interesting because it suggests, and this is clearly true. I mean, so I, you know, it suggests that there is something that the problem isn't in our desire to live online, that there, there seems to be a disconnect where you go, one solution is just not to post stuff. <laughs> like, like that's, that's a solution. And, and yet to so many people, it seems like there's no way who am I if I'm not there and I'm not it's tricky you know uh I have an 11 year old um that's a whole thing we have to manage and all these other kids I used to be a teacher but we have sort of bought into this idea that we have in order to exist fully it needs to be at least some of it online and for me you know I don't think it's I don't think it's particularly hard to not be a racist insane person online (laughs) Um, and I would invite people, people always go, well, anybody, and I go, go look at my stuff. I like maybe something is there, but I was on Facebook with the like 13 colleges who were there first. I was there in like 2004. I don't think there's anything there. Um, but there is something we've given up in giving power to the platforms themselves, which is actually like a secret passion project. Should I ever finish shame rules is, is a, and it's not earth shattering is to talk about the structural intersection of like society and algorithms, not just the algorithms themselves. So what, what is it? What are we now because of it? Um, Maybe we're meaner, maybe we're less forgiving. Maybe. hundred percent. Yes, we are. Uh, (laughs) Well, okay. You say that, but in the third episode of shame rules, I talk about how 10,000 people came and watched a poor woman get hung um, just because she'd been convicted of having a child, not with her husband. And you go, that's pretty messed up. Is it, I mean, are we not, I don't know. Is it any different, really? I, you know, at least this, this way you get to live. Yeah. I mean, modern. So it, it, yeah. Well, I would say going back to your Simpsons comment that that mob rule existed then back in the 1700s and it still exists now. It's just online. <laughs> well, yeah, sure. Well, it's, it's tough. Because the story of Maggie Dixon is, is a story about power. It's not about the crowds. In fact, the crowds tended to be very sympathetic, but they came to still watch people get hung. And the hanging was used as a way to say, you don't do this, peasants, or we, the, ch- the church, we, the state, can just freaking kill you. We still do that today. So I don't know if it's mob rule, because the mob, 10,000 people, could have stopped a hanging, and they didn't. So now uh online there is i I just like it's hard for me to it's like tough because i'm holding two positions at once what i'm saying is don't be those people that is i want that to be very clear i don't think i'm those people i do take time out to message i messaged someone today this morning for the second time who um was very pro insurrection pre you know kind of like until it all happened and then they disappeared and i just was like hey man what's Let's not, what I wanted just to be a person because I don't know where they stand to say something to them. But on the other side, I do think just like shame itself, we talk about shouldn't feel shame. Shame is bad. Shame the shamers, all of this language. And you sit there and you go, there's a certain level of, we have to just recognize that things are going to happen. Shame literally is an evolutionary emotion that we have. And so we can try to do better but you're not going to serve anybody if we all continue to go, isn't it bad that the crowd is shaming me? You go, well, yeah, but they are. So, <laughs> so now what you're, you, you know, Josh Hawley and you're whatever, you're not going to, what is, is there anything to take from that? And I do think that there is. Um, and it happens. I'm, I'm attacking people on the right because I'm not, I don't, I feel like this is non-controversial, but it happens on the left too, all the time. Mm-hmm. all the time so uh it shouldn't happen but it does and my only concern is about when it happens to people who aren't powerful really truly and call me in a year and maybe i'll go oh my god i can't i wasn't prepared to talk about this 
and I'm so wrong and I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, but I really do. I just, I go for some people, we don't have anything else. Like that's kind of, that's the thing I really struggle with. It's like people are so rich and so powerful and so distant from us. You go, so what are we, what are we supposed to do otherwise? Yes. Is there any, um, is there any other things that you would like to, to touch on? Cause I kind of feel like we went on a, a tangent. <laughs> Probably this is very different than most of your interviews. But. Well, I did. Well, so I will say it, it is, I will say I'm all, I ran before this interview, everybody. I'm like worked up. This is not, the show is a very, it's a very, it's calm, very calm. Yes. Yeah. It's very thoughtful, so please. But um, I do the, the, the episode. So there's three episodes now that took forever. There's two other scripts that are almost done, and there's a fourth episode that was supposed to come out in the week before the election, which is an exploration of the other and how, just in general as a concept, like the formation of another um, and what that is, and shame's role in that, and our own shame and a projection of their shame. And it was wrapped up, of course, in Donald Trump himself, because often what is said is that Donald Trump, people use the word shameless all the time. And there's no evidence. In fact, all the evidence supports the idea that he is highly, he feels shame very deeply. And I think that's really interesting. And so it's that, that's something that I just want people to think about as you, as we exist in this world. And when the episode comes out, um, hopefully you, you get to listen to it, shamerules.com. But there is something about, we, we are seeing the an unchecked person, and I've seen it, and a culture that has enabled it. Um, it's very, very destructive. I do not think Donald Trump is the first world leader who has suffered from that. Um, but it doesn't do us any good as a society to not see the shame. Um, that's, I think that's, we, we got to see it. It doesn't absolve him from anything at all. But maybe we would see what he does or people like that do differently if we went, oh, he, this, this is clearly somebody who feels shame about the size of their inauguration crowd or the accomplishments they made in office or, you know, whatever. They put their name in gold on buildings, all this other stuff, you know. Or, so it's, it's something that – and then the people who blindly follow, the other segment is about why – what – what value does the people from Mexico being rapists and whatever we were told, what, what's the role in shame in creating that boogie person, right? It's 2021. I've decided I can say boogie person now rather than boogeyman. Uh, <laughs> right. And there is, there seems to be there, there, it does to me seem like that there is a rejection of, of felt shame that if we just create another person, I mean, you saw it, you see it, I know this is might be oversimplistic. You see it in World War II, the lead up to it, right? Here's Germany completely destroyed after World War I. They don't have an economy to, to function on. How quickly do we, can we find someone else to avoid feeling responsible for this, <laughs> right? And there it had costs to it. So I, I just think it's like worth exploring um, and hopefully people check it out. So that was a long, a long rant, but that is, that's why the show has been on hiatus because I do, I want to handle it thoughtfully. Um, but I also think it's worth talking about. It's absolutely worth talking about. You know, I always describe Donald Trump, and this is not, like you said, to absolve him of anything, but he was just a deeply wounded human. Yes. And um, so watching him and the way that I totally agree with what you're saying about him feeling shame, and he was such a, a symbol of our own collective dis-ease and with, with some of the things, our own kind of internal conflicts as well would show up there and in our, our interpersonal relationships. And so for me to kind of wrap this up, when I think about shame, we have to allow in order to, to stop perpetuating shame, we need to allow a path for redemption. We need to look at people as whole humans, as messy and complicated, and we mess up and we do try to do better. And we, you know, we just need to give, I guess, compassion is, is, is where I'm going at coming from is that we need to have space for, for people to, to be their whole messy complex selves. Well, and that there are certain things that I think people should feel shame for. If you intentionally 
hurt someone, you know, you, you know, whatever. But the, the other step to that would be how many of the things that I view someone's behavior as being shameful, how many of those things are like real? Like how many of the things that we, how much shame do other, we put on other people that are actually not just inventions of a society that has benefited from that shame. And, and I, I use trans a lot because I'm really struck by how brave and how hard it must be to sort of come out as trans. It's not, a, I just, I'm staggered by the bravery behind that. And you sit there and you go, if you just sit there and say, why? There's nothing inherent about that that is shameful at all. Like sort of, and if you just take one step back and you go, okay, so this thing that I'm judging this other person for that I'm giving them a hard time for or whatever, is it like a real thing? Like, so your point about people make mistakes and we're flawed is 100% correct. And I want to take one step back and go, how many of the things that we are condemning them for are actually shameful to begin with? Mm-hmm. Um, so, so that's, that's the other part of it. And, and that's kind of what shame rules tries to deal with in and of itself, just to go, let's just talk about who gets to decide what is shameful and then what our role is in perpetuating that. Yes. Wonderful. Well, just uh, leave my listeners again with how they can find you and your work and all that good stuff. Shamerules.com. I'm concerned I came in hot, everybody. Angela, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Don't do runs before podcasts. I've, I've learned a very valuable lesson. Uh, but shamerules.com is a place to go. If you're listening to a podcast, you obviously know how to find other podcasts. Um, there's three episodes now. They're about 45 minutes, 40, 45 minutes. In the next you know, two months, there should be three more. Um, ideally, I'd like to do another season where I facilitate other people's stories. There's definitely forms of shame that I do not feel qualified um, to tell. And so hopefully we can get around to that point. But for now, you get six episodes of, of me being kinder and nicer and more understanding. <laughs> <laughs> this is my yeah. own shame creeping in, Angela. Now I'm not having to go back and go, let's do this whole interview again. Oh, my gosh. No, I thought we talked, we have, we talked about some great things. And like I said, your, your shame rules is beautifully produced. And I listened to a lot of interviews. So it was really nice to have sort of that narrative and bringing in those, bringing in story and all of that. And I thought, yeah, it was well done. So check it out. Shamerules.com. Thank you. Are you enjoying this podcast and want to help this lady out? Well, share it with friends, or even better, leave a review on iTunes. We'd love to hear from you. Now back to the show. Well, uh, that's the show for today. I hope you enjoyed our conversation on shame. If you haven't checked out Shame Rules, you should, especially if you only listen to interview podcasts, because the each episode of Shame Rules takes you on this beautiful journey. Uh, the, and so I really appreciated the the difference in uh, podcast production. So do check it out. Yeah. And coming up next week, we have the lovely Molly Mandelberg. And we're going to be talking about heart-centered entrepreneurship, which is something that is very near and dear to my heart and I think will connect with many of my listeners out there. So uh, that's the show for today. Take care and seek the mystery.